So in this video I'm going to talk about some components called capacitors and what they essentially are designed to do is store charge. So in many ways they're quite similar to a cell or a battery in that you can use them to store energy but unlike a battery they store their energy in an electric field whereas obviously batteries store in terms of chemical energy. And one of the advantages of this is capacitors can be charged and discharged a lot more rapidly than a conventional battery can, so you can get a much higher power output from them. So, most capacitors are designed in a way like this. They have two parallel plates, so there's two, two parallel plates like this, and you can connect these plates into a circuit. So let's connect it in a charging circuit to a cell like this. So, what happens in terms of them charging? So if you connect it in, if we see this circuit, this is our negative terminal, so your electrons are going to go around this way, which means we get a build-up of electrons here, and for reasons which I'll get onto it in a second, that means you get positive charge on this plate. So then if I connect a voltmeter across here, as the charge builds up, I'll see the potential difference across the capacitor increasing as it's charging. And in terms of looking at the relationship between them, that's what this equation here is explaining. It's saying that the potential difference across it and the charge are direct proportional to each other, and their constant of proportionality is the capacitance, or C for short. So let's have a look at charging capacitors first of all. So in order to charge a capacitor, you need a source of EMF in your circuit. It could be another capacitor, it could be a cell, battery power pack, with the national grid, whatever. So first of all, like I said before, you get a flow of electrons out of the negative terminal of your battery, so that's the shorter side of your cell. And as I showed on the previous diagram, that means you get a build-up of negative charge on this plate here. Now, as we know, electric charges have an electric field around them, and the more charges there are, the stronger the electric field is going to get. So as this field gets stronger, this has the effect of pushing electrons off of the other plate, like this. So you've, in fact, it looks like you've got a complete circuit, because you've got electrons going all the way around. Because you're pushing electrons off, that leaves the other plate overall positively charged. So, you're getting, essentially, you're increasing your negative charge on one and increasing your positive charge on the other. And as you do that, the potential difference increases. Now, as your potential difference across here increases, it acts to oppose the potential difference of the cell, because you can see they're connected in opposite directions, because this one is trying to push electrons that way, whereas this one is going to be trying to push electrons back round that way. And once they reach the same potential difference, that will mean there's no net flow of charge, so the capacitor is now fully charged using that power source. So let's have a look at that graphically to see what I'm talking about. So, we've got the same explanations up here. We're going to plot two graphs. So on one graph, we're going to plot charge against time. On the other, we're going to plot the potential difference against time. And again, remember, these are both charging. So, initially, you've got your maximum potential difference across the capacitor, or like net potential difference, if you like. Because your capacitor has zero potential difference, because it has no charge in it, and your EMF is its same fixed value. You've got maximum potential difference for the same resistance, you're going to have maximum current or maximum rate of flow of charge. So that means the gradient of your charge versus time is going to be at its maximum, because the gradient of this graph is the rate of flow of charge. That's going to look something like that. And as we know, we've got this relationship here, which means if Q looks like that, the difference is also going to look like that. So that's your initial part. So then it says, as your charge builds up, 
potential difference across your plates increases. This reduces the net potential difference in your circuit. Now, if your net potential difference is reduced, that means your net current is going to be reduced, which means the rate of flow of charge is going to be reduced. So what you'll observe is the gradient decreases, something along those lines. And again, they should, follow, they should track each other. And eventually, your potential difference across the capacitor becomes equal to that of the EMF source. So at that point, the net potential difference is zero. So then there's no current, so there's no rate of flow of charge. So then the gradient, oh, that was awful. and your gradient becomes zero. And you've leveled off like this. And this value here is often referred to as Q0. And if we look at the same graph over here, that's often referred to as V0. So that is your final either charge or potential difference like this. So that's your charging graph using a constant EMF source. So let's Move on to look at discharge types. So if we connect our capacitor in series here with, with a resistor, and we've currently got it at the point where it is fully charged. So let's charge our capacitor up, which means this one here will be positively charged. There's no particular reason why I've picked those right and left. I'm just using the same thing I was looking at earlier. So let's look at this here. So you've currently got a large potential difference across your capacitor and it's connected in a complete circuit so there can be a current. So as we said earlier there is a strong electric field here which is acting to repel any negative charges because it's a negatively charged field. That means it's going to push electrons around here all the way around here to try and get rid of the potential difference here. So initially there is a high potential difference because you have the maximum um, essentially amount of charge stacked here so you have the biggest potential difference across the capacitor so you get your maximum current flowing around. And as you lose these charges the potential difference reduces so your current in your circuit reduces and eventually it comes to zero. And we say a capacitor is fully discharged at around five time constants. And I'll explain what a time constant is in a second and how it's calculated, but we approximate a capacitor to fully discharge at five time constants. So let's have a look at this graphically just as before. So initially we've got maximum potential difference. So that means the gradient of your graph is going to be at a maximum initially. So we'll just do our QT and our VT again. Now remember, charge is going to be reducing on our plate, so it's going to be a maximum negative gradient. So let's start that off. We've got our maximum gradient initially. So then as charge is removed, the overall charge on your capacitor is reduced, so the potential difference is reduced, again using your Q equals CV. And if potential difference is reduced, your current is reduced, so your rate of flow of charge is reduced, which you see in terms of the gradient becoming a smaller magnitude number. I probably should have drawn that slightly better. It needs to actually get somewhere close to the axes at some point. And then finally, your potential difference is going to be smaller and smaller and smaller, so your gradient is going to be smaller and smaller and smaller. And as you can see, this is asymptoting towards the x-axis, so it's never actually going to reach it, which is why we have that thing I discussed earlier, that we approximate that it's completely discharged at five time constants, and it's the same here. So keep talking about time constants. What are our time constants? So the time constant is the time taken for the charge or the potential difference to reach 30% of 
37% of its initial value when it's discharging or 63% of its final value if it's charging. And you can calculate the time constant using this equation here. So your time constant is the resistance that's either being charged or discharged through multiplied by the capacitance of your capacitor. So let's show you what that looks like and I'll show you in terms of the charging graph. So we've got our VT graph here as described by this equation above. That looks something like that. So if we go to this point here, this is your time constant and that's 63% of the final value, and which is that one up there. So that's approximately 63% if you're charging. And it's exactly the same if we plot a charge versus time graph, like that. Again, you get exactly the same thing, so that's your final, and this is your 63%, if we drop that down. That is your time constant there. So it's a useful value for comparing how the rate of discharge for capacitors for each of them. And so these graphs are described by this equation here. So if that's your equation for potential difference, essentially you can therefore express your charge as a function of time as well. Because remember, these the two are just linked by the capacitance as they're proportionality constant. So you equally also have this equation which describes the graph on the right hand side here. So that's charging. Let's have a quick look at discharging equation. So very similar looking equation here. So we're going to do these two graphs. Remember our graph looks something like this approximately. And if we again dot those in, there's your 37%, there's your 37%, and it's of the initial value this time. And whether you're charging or discharging, if you don't change the parameters of your circuit, you should find the time constants are exactly the same. So then we need to look at the energy stored, because I was saying earlier that the energy is stored in the form of an electric field. So if we plot a graph of charge against potential difference, we know they're directly proportional to each other. So you get a graph that looks like this. And if you remember your circuitry, we had your work done is your Q times V. Now this only applies if one of the two are constant. If you're one of those, two, if they're both changing like they are in here, this is actually slightly different. So what you're actually calculating is the area under this graph to find the energy stored. And the area under this graph, it's a triangle, so it's half base times height, which would be half base V times Q. So your energy is the area underneath this graph here. And these other two equations are just found by substituting in this value here or a rearrangement of that equation here. So if you want to get these other equations here, it's just a case of substituting in this equation into this form here. But that's where that's coming from, that's where your energy stored is. So let's have a look at a couple of example questions so you can see this in action. First of all, a 200 microfarad capacitor has an initial potential difference of 6.0 volts. And then it's discharged through a resistor of 200 kilo ohms. So you, these are fairly typical values for things, although sometimes you'll see these in kilovolts as well. So you wanted to calculate the charge after 6 seconds. So we've got a couple of key equations we're going to need to use. So the first one I'm going to stick in is we want to work out what the only original charge is based on your capacitance and your initial potential difference. So we can do that. So we've got 200 times 10 to the minus 6. And we're multiplying that by 6.0, which gives you an initial charge of 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 coulombs. 
And then we want to find the charge at a certain time, and it's discharging, which means we can apply this equation to it. So we've plugged the numbers into this equation. So we want to know the charge at six seconds. Let's put those numbers in. And you should end up with this format here. And if you get your calculator out, or in terms of Excel, like me, you will come out with this value here. Minus three coulombs, or 0 0.0 millicoulombs. And because your potential difference is given to two sig figs, two sig figs is the appropriate number for your answer to this question here. So moving on to looking at charging. So it tells you the same 200 microfarad capacitor is charged using a constant current of 2.0 amps. Calculate potential difference across the capacitor after 10 seconds. So this time it tells you it's being charged with constant current. So if we want to work out actually the charge added, we can revert back to one of our old circuitry equations because it's told you I is constant, which means we can use 2.0 times by 10, which gives you 20 coulombs, which is quite a big charge to have. Then, remembering our equation for capacitors, we can calculate potential difference by taking the charge and dividing it by our capacitance. So we've got 20, but 200 times 10 to minus 3. So we're expecting quite a big answer for this one, and indeed it is. We get 1.0 times 10 to the 5 volts. And again, using the data we've been given, two significant figures is appropriate here in this answer. And that's actually what we get. So then the final part, calculate the energy stored. So this one's quite nice and simple. You've got Q, you've got V, so this is clearly a perfectly acceptable form. So we've got half times 20 times 1.0 times 10 to the 5, and that gives you an overall energy stored 1.0 times 10 to the 6 joules, or 1.0 megajoules. And again, two sig figs throughout, so two sig figs is appropriate as an answer to this question. And if you want to look at all of those solutions in a nice, neat form, there we go. So in case you couldn't read my writing from before or weren't sure what something was saying, there they are in nice, tight-out Comic Sans font for you to have a look at.